He was the one that actually recruited me out of prison to start speaking to Major League Baseball players about the dangers of gambling, organized crime, the relationships that they keep. And quite honestly, if it wasn't for Kevin, I don't know if I would ever been a speaker. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. Everything is very good, very blessed on this end. As always, I give God all the praise, honor and glory and thanksgiving for that. And I really do mean that. Before we begin, I wanna thank everybody who jumped on to our Mob Ties remade uh, private call that we had, the private Zoom call. I think we had about 500 people on the call. It was uh, tremendous. And for those of you that may still wanna be involved, uh, we're going to post the link. I think it can still get in it. It might be closed out at this point in time, but uh, it's a tremendous platform and uh, we created a real community a family and people are getting a lot out of it. So uh, today my guest is somebody that's very special to me. He's a fellow by the name of Kevin Hallinan. And the reason he's special is because Kevin was the head of Major League Baseball security. He was the one that actually recruited me out of prison to start speaking to Major League Baseball players about the dangers of gambling, organized crime, the relationships that they keep. And quite honestly, if it wasn't for Kevin, um, I don't know if I would ever been a speaker. And over the past 25 years, I've been uh, very fortunate, very blessed to be a prolific speaker, speaking all over the world. I think um, some of you, at least, who, uh, who are watching now have seen me in different places. I get messages all the time. But he's got a tremendously interesting story. He's got a great resume. He was involved in so many things on the law enforcement end, along with his activities in Major League Baseball. I want to read you a little bit about him, and he's got a tremendous book out. It's called Over the Wall. I really encourage you, suggest that you read it. For all those of you that are into, you know, law enforcement, some of the you know, the things that they faced, Major League Baseball, the contribution that he made to sports. It's extremely interesting, and I encourage you to read it. You can get it on Amazon. I think we'll have a link listed, uh, or shown rather, in this video. Let me tell you a little bit about Kevin. Kevin Hallinan is known as an innovative leader in professional sports, security, and operations. Serving under four commissioners as the Senior Vice President of Security and Facility Management, Hallinan oversaw security for all 30 Major League Baseball clubs, creating revolutionary new systems to better protect the game and its players, and I was one of those revolutionary new systems. On USA Today's list of baseball's most influential people, Hallinan served as chairman of the Team Coalition and as a member of the New York State Policy Study Committee on Terrorism and the Police Executive Research Forum. Prior to MLB, Hallinan was commander of the FBI-NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force, where he was recognized for his contributions in the war on terrorism. He uh, testified before the U.S. Congress on domestic terrorism and received numerous NYPD FBI citations and the U.S. Attorney General Award for Exceptional Public Service. Hallinan earned his collegiate degree at Fordham University in the Bronx and attended the FBI National Academy. Very interesting guy, and I can tell you this, he really was concerned about protecting Major League Baseball and, of course, the players. And the whole program that we were involved in uh, for many, many years was geared to that. And uh, I, I uh, you know, I uh, get very satisfactory information today about, you know, our contribution to sports at that time. And Kevin did a heck of a lot more than just bring me in. Believe me, he was involved in the Olympics in 1984. He was a uh, head of security for that. Uh, he's just made tremendous contributions to pro sports uh, in all of the leagues because many of them followed his league in doing some of the things that he did, you know, to help protect the players and the integrity of the sport. So without going any further, I want to introduce my good friend, uh, Kevin Hallinan. All right, so here you are, Kevin. I, uh, I just uh, alerted my audience as to my viewers, I should say, as, uh, as to who you are and the fact that you have a terrific book out there entitled Over the Wall. 
I gave him a lot of background on you, uh, you know, your resume, your career. And uh, I've been looking forward to this because, Kevin, I got to say this. You know, I've been speaking now for just about 25 years. And uh, in, in a big way, I owe it all to you because you were the one that got me started. And uh, I want people to know how it all began, how I met you, what we did together. And I've told my wife this, I tell everybody, if it wasn't for Ke Kevin Hallinan, I probably would never have been a speaker. And you started me off. So why don't you tell them how we met? Okay, well, uh, what happened was when I initially joined Major League Baseball, I had it in, in the first month or two that I was there, uh, Peter Uberoth asked me to uh, address the Dodgers in spring training. And so I went out, I went to spring training and uh, met with uh, Tommy Lasorda and crew. And, uh, and I talked to the players probably about 15, 20 minutes. And, I, and it, it seemed to be okay, but I came out of it thinking, talking head really doesn't do it anymore. And quite honestly, a New York cop coming in here talking to players, I could see a lot of them, you know, almost turning me off before I got started. So I knew I wanted to go in a new direction and I wanted to be proactive. That was really my part of who I am, both in, in law enforcement and in baseball. So what I did was my last assignment in law enforcement was the first commander of the FBI NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force, the first in the country. And it was really a challenging assignment because we were bringing detectives together with agents who had been competitors for years. And uh, building teamwork was uh, uh, a very interesting assignment. and and. Fortunately, through the help of a lot of good people, it, it, it came together and quite honestly, so good that they started creating. In fact, they asked me to be the national coordinator and I was talking with baseball at the time. So the salary didn't match up very well. So it was baseball. But what happened was- but Kevin, let, let me just stop you for a minute because it was very interesting. I, I think people don't understand how difficult it is or how there is so much competition between federal and state and city law enforcement agencies. And the task of bringing them all together must have been monumental. I, I know that couldn't have been easy. Well, it truly it wasn't because what happened in the agreement that was signed by the, uh, the commissioner and the director of the FBI, NYPD initially sent 10 detectives over to 26 Federal Plaza to work full time. And what happened, a number, well, a small number of agents and several detectives refused the assignment. They, they couldn't do it. They, they just said there was uh, too much had gone on in years past that wouldn't allow them. So we had to have people who were agreeing to be part of the team. And when they got over there, there was, uh, you know, interesting, the civilians that work for the FBI, you know, they would give you, oh, well, I'm sorry, I can't show you that. I have to speak with an agent. You know this this kind of stuff, and uh, it took it, it it took time. And one of the things that happened, we got involved in, in a major shootout at the Whitestone Motel with a group that had uh, doing armed robberies and did a major burglary of a uh, a gun collector and took out all of his weaponry and came to the Bronx to sell it to a terrorist group. Uh, they were meeting us and they didn't know it. And 36 shots later, uh, we made the arrest and, and got things done. But what most most important was bringing the agents and detectives together in the planning as to how we were going to do it. And this teamwork, if you will, I could see was slowly they were starting to partner up together. Uh, there were agents who were asking me, could I work with this detective? It was like picking a girlfriend, Michael. It was, it was really something. A sociologist would have had a terrific time with it. But having said that, a lot of FBI high-ranking people came to New York to find out, is this really, is this happening? Is it, is it going on? And will it be successful? Well, it took time. It, a lot of major things happened. A Brinks robbery up in Rockland County with 11 of these folks came in and killed two police officers and a, and a bank guard. 
And we got into safe houses and we found explosives and everything like that. That's a whole story that's in the book. But what happened was the ranking people were really pleased at how this was coming together and started to add people to it and resources. Now, because of the, them coming to New York, I got to meet them. Well, one of them ended up the second ranking uh, agent in the FBI who became a good friend. He stayed closely in touch with me. So when I got to baseball, after that Dodger experience, I took a trip to, I called him and I took a trip to DC and I sat down with him and I said, look, here's what I need. I need somebody and he has to be the right person to accompany me with me to meet with major league players and talk about the challenges their careers face from organized crime, gambling, drugs, women, et cetera, et cetera. Organized crime is the whole package. If I could get them prepared and have an understanding of how organized crime goes about it, I would be, they would be more importantly, much better prepared to deal with it. Well, what happened was he said, okay, here's the deal. I'll get you an agent who is pretty close, uh, has had people that he was working with and, and we'll get you somebody. Well, he did. And the first one I met with, and, and you'll get a laugh out of this because you do well, I certainly knew of him, Henry Hill. It's the first one I met with. <clears throat> I'll never forget it. I took him to lunch with the agent in Los Angeles. And I have to tell you, it was an experience. <laughs> Henry Hill's imagine. conversation, every second word began with F. So I said, uh-oh, this guy's not going to make it in front of the camera. I want somebody. And I told the agent, somebody who's, or I, I, I mean, I, I use the word articulate, but I said somebody who can talk, who they're going to trust and say, oh, this guy, this guy's getting it over. He understands and he's able to explain just what the challenge is. Well, the next name up was Michael Francis. And I don't recall that agent's name, but you knew him pretty well. Uh, he was a guy that you knew. And uh, unfortunately, uh, at that time, you were uh, somewhat unavailable. I think it was called Lompoc. Correct. I was in the hole in Lompoc. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And we, as, as you recall, uh, were working out a deal with you to get you out and uh, a hotel stay and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, an earthquake happened to come along. And I'll never forget, Kevin, I was all set to come, and it was a Monday morning when the earthquake hit, and that stopped all movement for the Bureau of Prisons. That was it. Yes, and, and that was it for us, too. So we, we were kind of stuck. By the way, I should say that I was looking for MLB to do this production. Michael, I'll tell you now, uh, because many years have gone by, I got 50000 from each one of the professional leagues, I had to go before the NFL, the NBA, National Hockey League, and of course, my own commissioner, who really, you know, didn't believe what I was up to. And I, I convinced him. And what I did was my first stop was, I'll never forget it, the NBA and David Stern. And I went over to the NBA and they had all their top brass at the front of this, this meeting room. And just about to get started and David Stern walks in and he sits down and I'm at the podium there and, and ready to go. And I did about four minutes and Stern stands up and says, we're in and walks out. Just and like everybody, everybody was shocked. He bought, he understood what I was talking about, the difference that it could make with the players and understanding the threat. This was going to be something special. So what happened was in the Major League Baseball was ill-equipped to do this, if you will, major motion picture that I was creating because I said, 
I don't want an army training film. You know, I want something that has a good script, has good people in it who are going to be uh, attractive to the audience, including good looking women. And I said, we're going to have good music. It's going to be something special. Long story short, though, Michael, it was put up for a monitor award. That's how good it was. I don't even know if you ever saw it. No, I did see it. It was, uh, yeah, you edited it down to about 20, 25 minutes, but it was, it just moved so quickly. And I was kind of shocked when I saw it because you, you featured me all the way through from beginning to end. It's exactly right. In, in your prison uniform, I might add. Yes, have. yes. <laughs> That I guess that really, made it more that made it more effective at the time, right? And probably so. And and it was it it was a showstopper when I brought that into spring training because again I realized that picture speaks a thousand words. And this they were frozen in their seats. That started me over almost well, it was 20 years. Every spring training, I met with 30 clubs and I had, it was showtime, it was entertainment, and it was about what what the challenges they were facing. And that video set the stage because, and then the other leagues, because we, if you recall, we made the athlete somewhat generic. So you didn't know whether he was a basketball player or football player, whatever. You know, we did have some storylines there with Rose and a couple others, but we had the other leagues were represented and they got the exact same response that I got. They, the commissioners all, they said, this is the way to go. At that time, Michael, these players were the MTV generation. Yeah. And, and it was so important to come through that and, and you Truly, if there was an Academy Award at that time for for these films, you would have got it because it was you that really made it happen. They were looking. You know what I said, Michael, uh, and I, I apologize before saying it. When people asked me about it, when I was interviewed about it, I said, having Michael Francis as almost part of my team now was like kidnapping, finding, capturing an enemy general because I was getting the full battle plan that was going to help me deploy strategies. And Michael was part of the team. He was looking to make good things happen. And the players, I mean, I had to stop the players. They were looking for your autograph. It was unbelievable. And I always gave you, if you recall, a very suspenseful opening. I kind of keep you out of sight until it was time. Oh, Kevin, I, I don't know if you remember this. You probably do. Uh, there was one time, I forget what team it was, but you had me pull up in a, they were in a tent. You remember that? And you had me pull up in a limousine and you had two guys that were, they were, they were cops, but they, they would look like they were mob guys. And you had me walk out of there into the tent Kevin, you could have heard a pin drop. It was like, oh, my God, these guys were scared. Michael, it was a media tent that had been left up, and I was able to use it. And, yes, you're absolutely right. The tent had a flap. The place was dark except for the monitor that we had. Larry Walker, who's in the Hall of Fame, and, and Walt Weiss, who was a, a Rockland County guy, were sitting in the front row, and they said when that flap opened and that car, the timing of it was perfect, this black limo pulls up, and you, in the dark glasses, the door, they open the door for you, and you come in. Larry Walker and Walter Weiss said they thought they were going to get hit. They, 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 everybody was, you're absolutely right. It was probably one of the greatest moments of the 30 shows. That tent and you coming in at that time, holy mackerel. And, and I don't know if you remember, I remember the words that you, you were talking about me. It was all dark. And then you just said, and here he is now. And that's when the tent opened and I walked down the aisle. And these guys, you could see it on their faces. 
They were scared. It was funny. Uh, Michael, if you recall, when I used you in the Rookie Career Development Program in Lansdowne, Virginia, the management center, which is a beautiful place, the other speakers and the Second City group, the actors group from Chicago that we use for, for the, uh, uh, the storylines and onstage right. stuff for the players, when they saw what I would do with you, where I would have you, you'd come into the ho- you'd come into the hotel and you'd go direct to your room. We'd, we'd feed you in your room, et cetera. So yeah. when it came showtime, everybody was already in place in class. And we brought you backstage and we had a podium. And the way we did it was we had the curtain closed and just the podium. And I showed the video to set the stage, gambling with your life. And then I come on the stage, on the center of the stage, and I would say to them, this afternoon, and I'd start walking as I was saying it, this afternoon, you are going to meet, I go down the stairs, and I'm on the side aisle, I still got the microphone, you're going to meet someone who would be the most dangerous person you ever met in your career. Now I'm almost at the back of the room. And as I get just at the back room, I say, he's here today. And then I point to the stage and my guys have you staged behind the podium and you arise like you're coming up from the dead. You come up. And the silence in the place, and, and at times you would have the leather jacket on and the glass. It when the first time you did the rookie career development program, Don Fear and Gene Orza were there, and you know, I thought, I thought they were going to have a heart attack, and you were going, and you still had them, and still stunned silence for over forty five minutes, and Orza with fear whispering in his ear, comes over to me and says, let him go as long as he wants. You And I have to tell you, every presentation that you made at the Rookie Creative Development Program, we had probably 15, 18 speakers over those three and a half days. You were number one rated every single appearance that you made at Rookie Creative Development Program they had you as number one. And then it was like Saturday afternoon at the confessional to line it up to talk to you. I mean, yeah. Michael, it, uh, you were a showstopper. Well, you know what, Kevin? I, I, I remember that. It was, a, it was a great time. I mean, really, I enjoyed it so much. And, you know, the, the most satisfying thing is I think we really educated those guys and put the fear of doing some wrong things. Because I remember we talked to them, obviously, about the dangers of gambling uh, and we knew there were some issues going on there. And then the relationships that they keep, how they had to be careful, who was giving them gifts or putting their arm around them and trying to get close to them. And, uh, and just, you know, really putting them on their guard, which they needed to be. And I like to think it was a very successful program. Michael, another thing that you brought up, which was always a danger, was the issue with women who, who were targeting them. Yeah and how all that worked and and uh, believe me that was critical education there was one more appearance that you made that was an absolute showstopper and it's the first time it ever happened and i was fortunate i was the producer and director <laughs> i created a sports security a professional sports security symposium mm-hmm in Lansdowne, Virginia again, and I got the NFL, hockey, basketball, and and I allowed soccer in as well to come to it. But what they had to do was I wanted all of their security people coming to the program, all of ours, all four leagues, five leagues were, were bringing their security people there. And the way I had it set up was the Chicago security people guys from all the leagues would sit together. The New York guys would sit together. Cross fertilization, get to talk to each other, know each other. So even in the off season, 
they would be able to exchange information and intelligence as to what was going on out there. That day, we had you and his name, you probably know, Gino Bonavolata or something. Yeah. He was the head of organized crime for the FBI. And did, did was Joe Pistone there at that time? Joe Pistone was there. Yes. You know, he was there. Joe Pistone. That's, that's, when, I, his, that's uh, when I first met him outside of, you know, when I met him in the life. Yeah, and I remember looking at Joe, because I had only met him one time on the street with somebody. Thank God for that. I'm glad I didn't meet him more on the street. But uh, I said to him after that, I said, Joe, you know what? You, you look more like the mob guy than I do. You know, the way he talked and his mannerisms. And, uh, you know, we became very good friends uh, from that day forward uh, until today. I love the guy. He is, uh, he, he was extremely helpful to me and he agreed. And, and can you imagine a cast of having yourself, the head of the FBI organized crime, I'm mispronouncing his name, Bonifolano or something Bonifolano, like that. Yeah, yeah. He was there and, and, and Pistone, who had done all those years undercover uh, for the FBI and, and made a terrific movie, by the way. Yes, very the good. The movie was excellent. And, they, if you recall, we set up a bar scene at where a yeah. player and his girlfriend came in. Yes. <laughs> and you guys were at a table and you're going to buy him a drink. I mean, the whole setup was absolutely terrific. And, and the FBI director actually came to the program on the last day and he couldn't believe uh, what the agenda that we had and the fact that we had the leagues talking together for the first time in history. Unfortunately, I would hope that something would, would come back again. But again, the sharing of information, I always let the other leagues know my safe is open. I'm not hiding anything. If I find something that works, I want you guys to be part of it. So they made me, if you will, the team leader for professional sports security, any kind of interviews. In fact, believe it or not, uh, cricket came over from England. This was the international cricket came over and wanted to talk about what they could do. To, they had gambling problems big time. And they met with me. And then they, about a month or two later, they flew me over to London, England, uh, to the Lord's Cricket uh, uh, place in, in, in London with all the international owners. And I talked to them. In fact, I showed them gambling with your life. I talked about you and how important it was if they were ever to find somebody like you, that it could make a major difference because, you know, law enforcement talking about it, security talking about it is one thing. A guy who lived it, knew the life, knew what it took, so there it is. I mean, there was so much information. We could actually have a part two. And interestingly enough, in his role as an NYPD officer, uh, he did get involved with some of the mob guys, but not too many. It was totally my era when he was on the street. Uh, but, you know, the guy has a lot of good information to uh, add about what's going on today. And maybe we'll do that in part two. But I love Kevin. You know, he, uh, he, he, uh, he did a lot for me early on in uh, my release from prison. He gave me something to, uh, to really start to think about as far as a career was concerned. And seeing that I had, you know, uh, a pretty good impact on the players, it motivated me to move further. And here I am 25 years later. So that's it for today. How do I always leave you? Same way, people. Be safe, be healthy. God bless every single one of you in this crazy world that we're living in today. And uh, yes, I'll see you next time.